I think this is everybody.
Chapel, please greet each other in the name of the Lord. We welcome our uh, viewers from the internet. Glad to have you with us today. <laughs> Screen door on the side. That's a good song. I like that song. Bless you. Glad you're here. We'll continue our uh, our worship this morning. I think uh, I think you all probably know all of my announcements, but I'll just run through them in case there's anything that is uh, is helpful for you. Um, if you have a phone with you, please remember to turn it off. And uh, bulletins are over here. If you need one, please feel free to uh, grab up, uh, get up and grab one over there. It's got notes for the teaching today. Um, don't forget the tithe box is located over here, and you can give there if. If the Lord has led you to give today, and that's what you need to do, that's the place to do it, or you can do it by mail or at the website, calvarybirmingham.com. Uh, if you haven't visited the website recently, um, stop by there and check out some of the stuff that's there. All the, the teachings are there. Um, click on media when you go to the website. You can see and hear all the teachings. Uh, don't forget uh, about the prayer room halfway down the hall here. There's a place where you can gather together in prayer. And a few upcoming events... Um, Thursday mornings at 6, a group of guys uh, meets for breakfast, and we've moved the location, guys. So uh, we are no longer at the uh, Waffle House over on 31. Uh, it seemed a little more central, I think, to move everybody to the, the Chick-fil-A that's over here off of Lakeshore. So that's the, that's the location. <laughs> All of y'all are excited about it, and you're not men, which is really funny. But, <laughs> but I love that there's some enthusiasm about that announcement. That's great. That's great. Usually these just sort of fall flat. Um, okay, so 6 o'clock in the morning on Thursdays for the guys at Chick-fil-A on Lakeshore at Wildwood Center. Um, Tuesday, February the 12th, which is this coming Tuesday, uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Right, Sean? 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. will be the prayer vigil at Planned Parenthood located at the corner of 27th Place South and Highland Avenue South. Also, from February 13th to March 24th, so a few weeks there, there will be 40 days of peaceful vigil from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you would like to participate in the February 12th prayer vigil, uh, just show up. And if you'd like to participate in the 40 days of prayer, then put your name on the sign-up sheet and we'll make the arrangements for you. And where's that sign-up sheet located, Sean? Do you know? Yes. Sean knows where that is. Uh, ladies' Night Out is Monday, February 18th. So it's not tomorrow, I guess, but a week from tomorrow. Uh, at, no, at Panera Bread. 
No enthusiasm for Panera Bread this morning? We got a root root for uh, Chick-fil-A, but nothing for Panera Bread. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a place. Um, Feb- Monday, February 18th at Panera Bread at the Summit at 6.30, ladies. Um, ladies' night out. Our monthly door-to-door outreach, Show and Tell the World, is coming up again on Saturday, February the 23rd. Uh, meet at the church at 10 a.m. And Saturday, March 2nd, is our next nursing home ministry at Rittenhouse Senior Living Center. Um, you can meet here at the church at 945 to help load up some stuff and take it over there, or just meet there at 1015. And on Sunday, March 3rd, a speaker from Chosen People Ministries will be sharing a message at the 10 a.m. service uh, entitled, Messiah in the Passover. We will learn the meanings of the various items from the Passover feast in relation to the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. So that sounds pretty cool. March 3rd, Sunday, March 3rd. Uh, And that's all I got. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves, he strengthens and sustains, he guards and he guides, he heals the sick, he cleanses the lepers, he forgives sinners, he discharges debtors, he delivers the captive, he defends the feeble, he blesses the young, he serves the unfortunate, he regards the aged, he rewards the diligent, and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't
can't tell you how long it took me to record that last night. <laughs> Excuse me, did everybody get a bulletin that needs one? If you didn't, they're just right up there. Move some of these cables around. There's a frog in the kick drum. In the kick drum. There's a frog on the pillow in the kick drum. <laughs> All right, so the Hebrew word of the week is Erev means evening, and of course uh, in your bulletin you have the uh, uh, verse cross-references and the do this, not that's and things in there, so uh, you can take notes about other things as the Lord leads you. This morning we're going to continue our study in Luke chapter 23. So if you'd go ahead and turn there, I will too. And that sign-up sheet that John was talking about, I laid it right over there underneath the joy box. <clears throat> All right, so the teaching application verse for this morning is Hosea, starting with chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Come and let us return to the Lord. For he, is, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. So let's pray before we study. Lord, we thank you for this morning and the words that you're going to speak to us, Lord. Thank you ahead of time for the challenges that you issue us, Lord, and, and just ask that we be faithful in doing the things that you are uh, teaching us. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us uh, in a special way this morning, um, perhaps something that, that we never considered before. And Lord, we just ask ahead of time that you would open up our hearts to your word, open up your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Now, that Jesus is God and that he died for our sins, was resurrected and ascended to heaven as recorded in the Gospels, as well as it's, it's even found in some extra biblical texts, is, those things are absolutely foundational to our faith. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. And in 1 Timothy 4, it continues and tells us that people will depart from that belief. And it warns us against teachings that deny any of these things. In fact, the denial of those things is called apostasy. You may have heard that word before. And it means a falling away from the truth. And Scripture encourages us to guard against it. Apostasy is no longer something that we only catch glimpses of. But we tend to see it now happening in such a large scale that the evidence of it is really to be found just about everywhere. <laughs> That our nation was founded on Christian beliefs has been called into question by historical revisionists. They desire to wipe all evidence that this nation was founded on God. Wipe it all away. The truth is not allowed in many schools, many courtrooms. The truth is, is outright denied in many of the highest offices of government. There are even churches where apostasy masquerades under the guise of relevance. Chrislam. Is, is gaining popularity, a mix between Christianity and Islam. Other interfaith, interfaith movements are becoming popular. 
Some pastors have become okay with bending what the Bible says to meet what people want to hear, resulting really in a watering down of the concepts of sin and hell. Now, there is no doubt that apostasy has gained traction in this nation and it is spreading like kudzu. And if we were going to stand against it, we have to know what it looks like. How to recognize apostasy? Well, to do that, we need to know how apostasy begins and what it leads to. Apostasy usually begins with a very subtle denial of, of key Christian truths, such as the triune nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the divinity of Jesus, the sinless life of Jesus, His death on the cross, and His resurrection. The end result of these little slides in apostasy is the eventual renunciation of Christian beliefs and the abandonment of Jesus. Now, every book in the New Testament contains warnings against false teachers. The book of Jude reveals to us much about apostasy, and it gives us an idea of what apostasy looks like. Some characteristics of apostasy. Characteristic number one is that it creeps in. Jude uses a word that means slip in sideways, meaning it's both sneaky and it's hard to detect. It's like a vine that's, that's growing on the side of the house and has beautiful flowers on it, and you might be tempted to keep it there until one day it, the vine starts to grow in between the cracks in the foundation, and pretty soon it undermines the house. Apostasy starts subtly, little slides that culminate in one big slide away from scriptural truth. Apostasy in those who bring it with them, like that vine, may look appealing on the outside, but in reality, they twist the truth to fit an agenda. Teachings that embrace the denial of foundational and scriptural truths can often be found where someone claims that they teach the real Christian doctrine as opposed to others who do not. Second characteristic of apostasy is it is ungodly. Those who have given themselves over to apostasy will use God's grace to do unrighteous works. In fact, Jude uses these words to describe apostates, saying they're mortally, morally perverted, denying Christ, ones who defile the flesh, rebellious, people who revile angels, who are ignorant about God, those who proclaim false visions, self-destructive, grumblers, fault finders, self-satisfying, use arrogant words and false flattery. They mock God, divisive, worldly minded, and unsaved. And Jude gives us a third characteristic of apostasy, is it denies our master and Lord Jesus Christ. Apostates deny him both verbally in their ungodly works. Paul writing to Titus, he said, they profess to know God, but their deeds deny him. So continuing in sin, that grace may increase, whereas a believer will be loath to sin. Romans 6, 1 through 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? A fourth characteristic of apostasy is it falls away completely. The ultimate end of apostasy is a complete falling away and a departure from the truth. I recently read a great example of apostasy in the church, and it came from a very unlikely place. It came from an interview with professed atheist Christopher Hitchens. You may have heard of the book that he wrote, God is Not Great. He died in 2011, so I guess he found out. But he, will, he, was, he was being interviewed by a minister, Marilyn Sewell. And in that interview, it goes like this. Let me read it to you. Ms. Sewell, she said, Mr. Hitchens, the religion you cite in your book is generally the fundamentalist faith of various kinds. I'm a liberal Christian, and I don't take the stories from the Scripture literally. 
I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement, that Jesus died for our sins, for example. Do you make a distinction between fundamentalist faith and liberal religion? Well, uh, Mr. Hitchens, the atheist, he said to her in reply, he said, well, I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're not in any meaningful sense a Christian. I couldn't have said that any better myself. In, in the case of apostate teachers, it's not only their hide that will get cooked, but those who they teach and lead, they lead them astray and they lead them into judgment. Jesus described the religious leaders of his day as blind guides leading the blind. But what can we do about it? What can we do about apostasy? Well, to start with, we should guard against it in the places that we have the most influence. Our hearts, our homes, our church, the schools our children attend, and local government institutions. Of those, the most important is our own hearts. See, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And perhaps you're familiar with that saying, garbage in, garbage out, or you are what you eat. See, everything that we allow into ourselves, whether by the, the ears, the eyes, or the mouth, colors the way we think, the way we act, and the way we live. And just as a, a dripping sink with a bowl in it will eventually fill that bowl and overflow it into other vessels in the sink, so the things we allow in ourselves do over time add up and influence others. It's the individuals in this nation who actually set the tone for the country. And if we are to affect change, it only makes sense that we start with ourselves and work outward from there. We must stand uncompromising and stalwart against those who desire <laughs> to weaken the faith. The moment we are willing to compromise on what the non-negotiables of Christianity, the minute we are willing to compromise on those things, we have already denied the truth. Today, as we study verse by verse through Luke 23, we're drawing close to the end of the Gospel of Luke. In our chapter, we will follow Jesus all the way to the cross and end with the burial of his body in a tomb. But there's one more chapter in Luke. And the truth of the gospel hinges on that chapter. Because in that chapter, Jesus is resurrected and ascends to heaven. So Luke 23, starting with verse 1. says, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate, you will remember, he the, was the governor of Judea, a Roman authority in the region. He was a man who was in fear of being removed from the position he had. In fact, history records that Pilate was later recalled by Tiberius and ended up committing suicide in AD 41. As the governor of Judea, Pilate's main home would have been in Caesarea Maritima, or, or Caesarea by the sea. But he also had a home inside Jerusalem, and whenever Passover, a major festival was going on, he would be there because of all the people that would be coming into the city. He would be there to make sure the order was kept. Now, I find it interesting that Pilate's name, Pontius, means belonging to the sea. See, the Jews, are, they were not fond of seafaring, and they thought of the sea as having an evil, chaotic nature. And in Scripture, chaotic seas are also sometimes symbolic of the Gentile nations, or the Goyim. It was at Pilate's discretion that sentences of life or death were carried out. And Jesus was a high-profile figure in Jerusalem. 
So the religious leaders of the nation, they couldn't just stone Jesus the way that they stoned later on Stephen. They had to go through Pilate to have Jesus crucified. Now Pilate had no love for the Jewish religious authorities, and they had no love for him either. And it may have been out of spite that Pilate seems to make the religious leaders jump through so many hoops, as we'll see in this chapter. Now the accusations that the religious leaders <coughs> declared against Jesus were first that he was a corrupting influence, which is a lie. Second, that he taught people that they should not pay taxes, another lie. Third, that he proclaimed himself a king. Now, stay with me here. This is a subtle lie. They're twisting the truth. I'll explain in a moment. The charge that the Jewish council had come up with was one of blasphemy. Yet Pilate certainly wasn't going to entertain religious charges against Jesus. So they had to come up with accusations that Pilate would be willing to prosecute. On the first point, that Jesus was a corrupting influence, they couldn't have been more wrong. Wherever Jesus went, he brought people into a closer relationship with God. He pointed out the corruption of sin and pointed the way to forgiveness and healing. And certainly Jesus challenged people, but it was to let go of the burdens they were carrying and to take the easy and the light yoke of the Lord. There was no corruption at all in the life of Jesus. Jesus Christ pleased his Father perfectly through his life, through his words, through his actions. He lived in absolute obedience to the Father. He humbled himself before men. Jesus lived a perfect and righteous life, teaching righteously, living righteously, judging righteously. The religious leaders, however, they were the corrupting influence. They tainted the truths of Scripture with religion. See, in life you will find that the, the guilty are often armed with a thousand accusations. Earlier in our study of Luke, Jesus had warned the people against the leaven of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy. And leaven in Scripture is often a picture of sin because of the way that it infiltrates the whole lump of dough and causes the bread to puff up. At the last men's breakfast, we all had a very interesting discussion about leaven and, and salt in the grain offering, something we had studied that Wednesday night in Leviticus. And John pointed out, he, he's been cooking for a long time, so he knows these things, he pointed out that, that adding salt into dough keeps leaven at bay. Now, such was the case of Jesus' early ministry. And we Christians as well are called to be salt in this world, to have a stabilizing effect on the leaven of the world, the sins of this world. In fact, prophetically speaking, it's not until the church is raptured, taken out of this world, back to Jesus, that the Antichrist will be able to come on the scene and deceive the world. Today, many people still try to say that Jesus perverts the nation. They're trying to legislate Jesus out of the institutions of this country. Yet, to the contrary, as Jesus is pushed out of places, whether that's school or government, we find that corruption doesn't decrease, but increases dramatically. How many times in the past decade have we heard the question asked, where was God when such and such happened? That question, the fact that it has to be asked so often, is symptomatic of a nation that has neglected and relegated God, pushing him away to special occasions only. And it's a question we would not have to be asking if, if this nation would just repent and turn back to God. Now, on the second accusation, that of, of teaching people not to pay taxes, of course, that was a lie. Jesus humbled himself as subject to the governing authorities of the land, as well as to the authority of the high priest. In Matthew 22, he publicly taught that taxes are to be paid, and the Bible even records that he had Peter go to the shores of the Sea of Galilee to receive from a fish exact change to pay the temple tax, right? He paid taxes, and he taught people to be obedient. Jesus was obedient, in fact, to the point of death at the hands of those he created. In John 10, 18, he said, I, No one can take my life from me. 
I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to, authority to lay it down when I want, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Jesus went to the cross willingly. Now, for that final accusation, that he said that he himself is Christ a king, this was a very subtle lie. This was a twisting of the truth. John records Jesus telling Pilate in John 18, 36, Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. See, Jesus did, in fact, say that he was the Messiah and king. And he answered in the positive to Pilate when asked about it. But the charge from the religious leaders inferred that Jesus was leading a rebellion against Rome. Something that Pilate knew there was no evidence for. And with all of these trumped up charges and Pilate seeming to see them as false charges, it seems like there's no way Jesus could have possibly been sentenced to death by crucifixion, except that it was God's plan. Jesus was led before Pilate in order that prophecy would be fulfilled. See, when the Jews put someone to death, they put them to death by stoning. But Scripture said the Messiah would be crucified. Deuteronomy 21.23 For he who is hanged is accursed of God. And Isaiah 53.5 But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Only crucifixion could fulfill the prophesied death of the Messiah. And only that could happen at the hands of the Romans. Genesis 49.10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. In the year that Jesus was born, the ability of Jews to self-govern was taken away. Rome no longer allowed them to lay down capital punishment. That was when the scepter departed from Judah, and that is when the lion of the tribe of Judah was born. In order for the religious leaders to, to pursue a death penalty for Jesus, they had to go to Pilate. Verse 3. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It's as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning, with Ga beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod who was also in Jerusalem at that time. There were many irregularities associated with the trial of Jesus, among which were the illegality of his being tried at night and being tried at a private residence. But now night had passed, and it was now the day, and Jesus is allowing himself to be accused by Pilate. Now, the Hebrew word for evening is Erev. In fact, its, its meaning of evening is de derived from its deeper meaning of disorder. But where we pick it up in Scripture today, the evening has passed, and it's now morning. The Hebrew word for morning is boker. And its meaning of mourning is derived from its deeper meaning of order. Now, the law of entropy is the second law of thermodynamics, states that all systems are moving from a state of order to disorder. Think of looking, if you're, if you're over 30, think of looking in the mirror and you see the, second, you see the law of entropy at work. Think of ice melting. But God, through Jesus, he's doing something very interesting here. He's doing what I call a reverse entropy. By his substitutionary death on the cross, God is establishing order from disorder. He's squeezing the old cloth of sin and death, and he's wringing out new life. 
Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, I haven't reminded us of this in a while, that God isn't defined or limited, <laughs> excuse me, or limited by us. He operates outside of our limitations, making all things new, as he says in Revelation 21. God's in the business of redeeming those things that are broken. Part of the wonderful mystery of salvation is the way that God redeems the, the base and the foolish things and uses us as tools of his victory. The profit of sin, or the wages of sin, is death. All the time, every time. But the one-time sacrifice of Jesus, who lived a perfect and sinless life, paid the debt of sin, and deposited His righteousness into the account of all who believe on Him. Now, we who were once slaves of sin, as Paul says, once slaves of sin, yet free in regards to righteousness and yielding shameful fruits, we are now slaves of God to yield the fruits of holiness. And that's, that's on a personal, individual level. But, but let's, let's consider the millions and billions that make up the population of this world. You know, these things, the sin being compounded upon itself. I'm sure we would all say that, that culturally, especially in, in this nation, we're more familiar with this nation than others, I would say, but we would all probably say, yes, things are going downhill quick. And that's because, as the Bible puts it in, in Romans 3, it says there is none righteous, not one. And it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what happens when you add mud to mud? You just get more mud. It compounds itself. And that's what happens in, in the world in regard to sin. You know, it compounds itself, yielding more sin. When I was in college and, and studying archaeology, I would have occasions where I get to go out on digs or, or archaeological surveys, and every once in a while we'd run into something that we called a midden. Now, a midden was basically a very old trash dump. It was where the American Indians, the Southeast American Indians, it was a place where they would throw out what, the stuff they didn't want to keep, such as, you know, we would find uh, bones and, and things from their meals, what have you. We'd also find lots and lots of, of pot sherds, broken pots. And, you know, still to this day, we throw out broken pots. If, if the pot's broken, there's no point in keeping it. We throw it out. Yet... Not God. He, he keeps broken pots. Broken pots are actually His chosen vessels. We, we've all been through hard times. We've all been through things that have left us broken. There have been, and Jesus promised there will be more, dark and dangerous days, trials, tribulations, troubles. But God uses these things in our life so that He can mold us into better vessels. God is making us new, and as Romans 12 points out, we are able to play a part in that molding process. Well, how do we play a part in that molding process? Well, i got a couple of suggestions. First, Bible study. God tells us in 2 Timothy 3 that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, molding us and equipping us in service to God. And when we invest ourselves in Bible study, God invests His Word in us, and the product is an equipping for His purposes in our lives. Secondly, through church ten attendance and participation. Hebrews 10 exhorts us to continue in fellowship together, serving together, living out our lives in such a way <laughs> that we provoke one another to love and good works. You know, we've, in the church, in case y'all didn't know, we've got a couple of Zumba instructors here. And I would, I would imagine that, that when they are leading a Zumba class, it's an exercise class, in case somebody doesn't know what a Zumba class is. It's like a dance exercise kind of thing. I think Latin beats, right? Yeah. So, I don't know how to do the Latin. I can do the Charleston. But, but I would imagine that if somebody were to 
walk into that class, a brand new student was to walk into that class, one of the things that they would do would be to start watching the instructor to try and, and mimic, try and copy the things that the instructor is doing. And that way they learn how to move and what to do. Well, it's similar in church, just with less rhythm, I guess. So the do this, not that, is be open to learning from one another. Don't assume you've got it all figured out. You know, it works like this. I watch you guys and I learn. You guys watch me and you learn. We learn together and through one another, we are continually molded, we're continually refreshed, and we're continually renewed. God is doing that reverse entropy work on us. He's conforming us to the image of his son. He's chipping away the pieces that don't look like him. And he's using all of us together to do it individually. Now, instead of the progressively bad news that we receive through television or internet, God brings us good news. And once we've accepted it, it just gets better and better. So the question you may be asking yourself now is, what in the world does entropy have, and being renewed and redeemed have to do with the trial and crucifixion of Jesus? Well, quite simply, because that is what God is doing in this section of Scripture that we're studying today. In the midst of a sinful world, God is bringing order to disorder. Jesus will be crucified and darkness will descend over the earth as a transaction is conducted between the Father and the Son. A transaction that would place our sins on Jesus and place His righteousness on us. And so Jesus bore the punishment for sin while His righteousness is credited to our account. And so God then looks at us and sees His Son. You know, it's important that you know how God sees you. Because otherwise, it's, well, until you know in your heart that God sees you as clothed in righteousness, you will live your Christian life as if you are on a roller coaster of condemnation one moment and acceptance the next. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No exceptions. And as we talked about last week, it's important that we understand that we were sinners, now saved by grace. That while we are being sanctified, we are now justified in the eyes of God. It's just as if we never sinned. And that's some really good news. See, Jesus brings us good news, and he makes the good news manifest in the lives of all that are his. Psalm 100, verse 3, says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You know, when you say, I am saved, what do you mean? Uh, most Christians can't answer that question. What does that mean? I am saved. You know, and, and most of the time when somebody does answer, is able to answer that question, they're, they're more thinking of what they're saved from rather than what we're saved to. And certainly we're saved out of sin, death, hell. We're saved out of these things, who we used to be. We're saved out of that. But we're saved into something much, much better. See, salvation is not necessarily about what's gone behind anymore. You're leaving it behind. Salvation is about what's ahead. You know, I'm probably not the only one in this room that loves vacations. It's rare. <laughs> vacations are rare these days. But I love vacations. And, and whenever a vacation is on the horizon, my tendency is to think forward towards that because I know it's going to be fun, I know it's going to be enjoyable, and I want to get there soon. And I don't look back. The good news of Jesus is not what lies in our past, but what he has done with our future. Through Jesus we have hope and a future. Through Jesus, we have adoption as children of God. Through Jesus, we, what, what is awaiting you is better than anything that you could ever imagine. 
Now, Pilate didn't trust religious leaders any further than, he, further than he could throw them. And he realized that there was something else going on here. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Pilate knew they were envious of Jesus. My friends, beware of envy. Proverbs 14.30 says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. I remember hearing a story about a farmer who was envious of his neighbor's farm, and he would go out in the mornings onto his, his porch and look out and watch his neighbor working in his farm and just criticize him. Everything he was doing, he was doing it all wrong. Then one morning he walks out on his porch and looks out, and his neighbor is harvesting the crops. And he looks over to his, his own farm and realizes he forgot to plant in the first place. Envy will destroy you. It will distract you from doing the things that, that God expects you to be doing. The religious leaders, they're envious of Jesus first because Jesus was doing what they had neglected to do. And they knew it. He was teaching people how to love and worship God. Secondly, they were envious of his popularity. And third, they were envy, envious of his ministry. Now, I wonder if, had they not given themselves over to envy, I wonder if they might have been able to, at least at some point, take their eyes off of themselves long enough to receive his ministry. Now, notice that Pilate, he didn't ask Jesus, are you a rebel? Or are you teaching people not to pay taxes? Pilate asked, are you the king of the Jews? To which Jesus answered in the positive, and yet Pilate saw no crime being committed. And he testified to that, saying, I find no fault in this man. So Pilate, he was in a tight spot here. And when they mentioned Galilee, it gave him what he thought was an out, since Galilee was Herod's jurisdiction. So Pilate then sent Jesus to Herod. Verse 8. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with, with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Herod, he had heard about Jesus. Instead of addressing the charges that, that had been issued towards Jesus, he wanted Jesus to perform for him. He wanted Jesus to perform a miracle, do a trick. Jesus, however, he wouldn't answer any of Herod's questions. And when Jesus wouldn't perform, perform for him, he and his soldiers mocked Jesus, placed a royal robe on him, and sent him back to Pilate. Now, Scripture condemns those who mock, saying they are arrogant, they're unrighteous, and foolish. It even says that they're worthy of being cast out. And you know, Scripture doesn't, con doesn't condone mockery done by Christians either. So be careful. We all have Facebook pages. Most of us do. Be careful what you post on your Facebook page. Don't become known as a mocker. Now, up to this point, Pilate and Herod, they didn't get along. But Pilate saw something in Herod's treatment of Jesus that he liked. And just because Pilate seems reluctant in the scriptures to crucify Jesus doesn't mean he was an innocent player in all this. Let's remember that Pilate had the authority to not crucify Jesus. Verse 13. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. 
No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man. Release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief, chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. There was a custom in which the governor, Pilate in this instance, would release a prisoner at Passover... So Pilate's plan was that he would have Jesus scourged. That's what it means when it says chastised. Have Jesus scourged, with whipped, severely beaten, and then release him. He thought that in a choice between a known murderer and Jesus, the people would certainly prefer Jesus. He was wrong. You know, and that's a choice that continues to be placed before people today. Sin is a murderer, and yet people continually choose the murderer over Jesus. Now, it's not known whether this custom of releasing a prisoner at Passover originated with the Jews or the Gentiles. It was probably done by the Romans as a goodwill measure you know, toward the Jews, giving them this false feeling that they had some say-so in governing. Now, according to Matthew, Pilate presented the people with a choice— Barabbas or, or Jesus. Barabbas was a known rebel, murderer. He was not loved by the people. And so Pilate offered Barabbas as the alternative to Jesus, the, the man both he and Herod had found no fault in. Barabbas is a very interesting name. Bar is Aramaic for son. Abbas is Aramaic for father. So Bar Abbas was son of the father. Now, there's a number of Greek manuscripts that tell us that Barabbas, that his first name was Jesus, or Yeshua. Now, your attention, please. Pilate offered the crowd a choice between Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and Yeshua Barabbas, Jesus, son of the Father. Jesus had no earthly father. He was born miraculously of a virgin through the Holy Spirit. Yet he would claim the title of son of man, Ben Adam, for himself. Barabbas, or son of the father, was born of an earthly father into sin, the way we all are. Yet he would be chosen by the world over the Messiah. Now, on one hand, we have the will of God being fulfilled that Jesus should die on the cross for our sins. On the other, we have the choice of the world for its own over the provision of God. We are all sons of fathers. We have a picture of, in this, we have a picture of the choice that we are all confronted with. You know, choose ourselves over Jesus or choose Jesus over ourselves. Jesus said in Luke 9, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Now Jesus is still not the popular choice. In fact, when, when given the option, most people will choose the sinner over the Savior. As we continue studying verse by verse through the Bible, we'll notice that the Holy Spirit 
tends to repeat things over and over, things that he wants us to understand, as if he's highlighting them for us. The innocence of Jesus is one of these things. And when Jesus was teaching in the temple, all the religious factions within Israel came to him to test him. And they were unable to find any fault in him. Matthew 27 records that Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, afterwards declared Jesus innocent. Pilate did the same thing, no less than seven times. Jesus, in his life, he demonstrated complete obedience to God, despite his human frailty, which is extremely important for his being the perfect atoning sacrifice. For his righteousness to be imputed by God onto us, he had to be perfectly innocent and righteous in all his ways. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, Jesus was tempted to sin, but resisted temptation. He committed no sin, always speaking the truth and completely fulfilling the law. His sinlessness is the grounds of believers' sanctification. Hebrews 10.14 says, For by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sacrificed. This is important because first, on the cross, he could be a worthy substitute for sinners. See, had he have sinned, he himself would have needed a savior. But because he was without sin, his sacrifice was acceptable and his blood was precious in the eyes of the Father. Secondly, as sinless, he secured his place on David's throne. From there he reigns forever and, he pro and his promises are established forever. Third, his righteousness makes us righteous before God. As the verse we just read says, we are not just made righteous, but become the righteousness of God in him. Fourth, he is perfectly sympathetic. Because he was tempted in all ways, as you and I certainly have been, yet he did not sin, he is able to represent us forever before the Father. Now, Satan would love nothing better than to undermine the truth of Jesus' sinless life by spreading the lie that Jesus was not sinless, that his life did not atone for sins. As we saw from the example earlier where a pastor of a church was the one that was interviewing Christopher Hutchins, or Hitchens. And the pastor of the church said that she does not believe and atonement. That's why we talked about apostasy today. Because everything we're talking about this morning is absolutely foundational for our faith. If any of it is pushed to the side or denigrated or made weak, then our faith is of no effect. We have to guard against apostasy and when we hear it, we need to call it out and name it what it is. I think this is, this is why so many books, reports, and documentaries these days have been made attempting to bring doubt about Jesus' sinless life. See, a sinless Jesus is power. A sinful Jesus is a powerless sacrifice. Verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus, who had been the cross beam. And a, certain, and a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say, The mountains fall on us and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the greenwood, what will be done 
and the dry. 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah 52 and 53 were written. 1,000 years before the actual events, King David wrote Psalm 22. All of these are a very vivid prophecy of his crucifixion. In fact, if you sat down and read them, you could very easily get the impression that the writers were actually there for the event. The challenge for this week, and this is, gets you out of any comfort zone you may possibly have, the challenge for this week is sit down with a friend who doesn't know Jesus and read to them Genesis 22, Isaiah 52 and 53, and Psalm 22, and then read Luke 23 to them and talk with them about it. Yeah. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Genesis 22. Isaiah 52 and 53, Psalm 22, and then Luke 23. It would take an incredibly hardened heart to put those chapters next to one another and not receive Jesus. Stoning, again, was the means of execution practiced by Israel, not crucifixion. In fact, death by crucifixion, it was invented by the Persians in 90 BC and was then adopted into practice by the Romans. Rome adopted crucifixion because it was absolutely horrifying. It was brutal. It took up to nine days before the inevitable death by asphyxiation. As a deterrent to crime and uprisings against Rome, it was extremely effective. In fact, we, we get our English word excruciating from a Roman word that means out of the cross. Roman statesman Cicero, he said this of crucifixion. He said, it is a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is an act of wickedness. To execute him is almost murder. What shall I say of crucifying him? An act so abominable, it is impossible to find any word adequately, adequately to express it. One commentator wrote of this. He said, how horrible must sin be in the sight of God that it should require such a sacrifice. Scripture tells us that Jesus began the road to Golgotha carrying his cross and he made it to the first gate before the beating and the scourging he had taken caused him to be unable to carry the cross any further. Simon, he was a man from the North African town of Cyrene. He, Sarian had a population of Jews located there during uh, the reign of uh, Ptolemy around 300 BC. Now, Sarian is located in modern day Libya, and the Jews of Sarian, they would have made the trip, the 800 mile pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover each year. Simon was then compelled by the Romans to carry the cross of Jesus. They didn't ask for volunteers. <laughs> They told him to do it. Now, Simon probably wouldn't have thought so at, the, at that particular moment in time. But, you know, he was at the right place at the right time. You see, Simon was incredibly moved by this experience. We don't have the moment it happened recorded in Scripture. But at some point later, as a result of carrying this cross, Simon was saved. He's mentioned in the book of Acts as a man of Cyrene who preached the gospel to the Greeks. Simon's sons, we discover, were also saved. Alexander and Rufus, they became missionaries. And they're mentioned later in Scripture as well. A wonderful change came to the whole family because Simon carried that cross. Now, a lot of people say, I don't like what's going on with my family. I don't like what's going on with my kids, the way they're acting. But then it's life as usual. But if the parents won't change, the kids certainly aren't going to change. So do this, not that. If you want to see your family change, then take up the cross of Christ, sacrifice yourself. Focus on God, don't focus on your family. Focus on God, and in doing so, you will focus your family on Christ. When, when Simon carried that heavy beam, something interesting happened. 
he had to put down whatever else he was carrying, no matter what it was, there wasn't going to be room for anything else. The world will tell us that life is about all we have, all we can get. It's defined by the stuff we pick up. But that's not how God, our Creator, defines life. No, real life is defined not by what we pick up, but by what we put down. One day when Jesus had encountered a rich young ruler who he wanted to know what he needed to do to receive eternal life, Jesus told him to put down all his stuff and follow him. Scripture says the man went away sorrowful because he had a lot of stuff. Paraphrasing. Stuff doesn't give life. Stuff just makes a mess. God gives life. Now there was a multitude that followed Jesus as he went toward Calvary. And concerned for others, even in his suffering, he warned them of coming judgment. Saying to those who were weeping, don't weep for me. Weep for those who reject me. And we should also have a divine sorrow for those who are rejecting Jesus. And that sorrow should well up in our lives and express itself as vigilance to see people receive him. Verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. For if he is the Christ, the chosen... Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine. And saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. When they reached that place of execution, Calvary or Golgotha, they crucified Jesus with two criminals, one on either side of him. There Jesus asked the Father to forgive those who crucified him, and his clothes were divided among the soldiers. Now the people continued their mockery of him, and the Roman soldiers started chiming in as well, offering him sour wine to dull the pain and prolong his misery. The Gospel of John tells us that Pilate himself was there, and that he personally wrote a sign and put it on the cross. And the chief priest, it tells us, freaked out about it. Now, why is that? What could have possibly been the problem? Well, the sign was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And said, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, King of the Jews. The first letter of the Hebrew words spelled out yod He vav He, Yahweh. In the name of God. Verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One of the criminals crucified beside him began to mock him, but the other rebuked him and asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. That was all it took for Jesus to assure him his salvation. Everyone in this world gets to be one of these two criminals. We all have sinned, so we belong on the cross. Jesus died for those sins, but we still have a choice of either denying him or receiving him. And you know, salvation is just that simple. It doesn't take a degree in theology. It doesn't take a sound understanding of doctrine. All it takes is enough of an understanding of personal sinfulness 
to repent and cry out to Jesus for forgiveness. These thieves, they were probably companions of Barabbas. I find it interesting then to, to consider that their master was set free while they paid the penalty. Contrast that to how we are set free and our master paid the penalty. Verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to, the, to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So from midday to three in the afternoon, there was darkness as the anger of God fell on Jesus who was bearing our guilt. In those three hours, Jesus paid the price, settled the debt, and finished the work necessary for man's redemption. The veil of the temple, long a symbol of separation between man and God, was then torn from the top down. The way had been made into the presence of God. The sacrificial system had been fulfilled in the death of Jesus. Verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, and a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was, awaiting, was, waiting, was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of rock, where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. We don't know much about Joseph, except that he was a rich man, that he was from Arimathea, that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and that like Nicodemus was, he was a secret disciple of Jesus. It was probably his association with the Sanhedrin that caused him to remain a secret disciple of Jesus. The Bible records that his friend Nicodemus opposed the council's violation of the laws as well as Joseph when they tried to accuse Jesus. And certainly, uh, certainly they both opposed the violations. Now just because... These guys were hidden disciples. They were both known as hidden disciples. It, just because they were hidden disciples, let's not assume that their actions were somehow inconsequential. In fact, while all the other disciples were either weeping or hiding or denying Jesus, Joseph was fulfilling prophecy that the Messiah, though he would die a criminal's death, would be buried in a rich man's tomb. You know, many of the missionaries that, that we support operate in hiding. Missionaries in places like China or India. They could face capital punishment or worse, yet they're incredibly effective. The tomb that was used, it was to be Joseph's family tomb. In fact, the Bible tells us that he himself had commissioned its creation in that spot. So Joseph and the other hidden disciple... John tells us, both laid the body of Jesus in the tomb. But it doesn't end there. We'll study his resurrection in the final chapter of Luke next Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead. How sad, how sad we should be had that tomb remained filled, had he not risen. But praise God, you know, Jesus rose breaking the, the bonds of death and giving us victory over death. The resurrection of Jesus declares to us that we can count on all that God has told us. And because the seal on that tomb was broken, our hope is sealed 
through Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we place ourselves before you today. Father, in no way did we deserve or do we deserve the way that you bore our sins and suffered on our behalf on that cross. We thank you for it. And Father, there may be those listening to the podcast, maybe they're watching on the live stream. Maybe there's those here who have never asked you to be their Savior. Lord, I pray that they would take this moment to do that, that they wouldn't put it off another day, another hour, another minute. And if that's you, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, be forgiven for your sins, and receive eternal life, then I want you to pray with me. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I have sinned. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and for rising again. Give me the power to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I thank you for any, I thank you for all that have prayed that prayer. Lord, I lift up to you each person here. Lord, these are your precious children. I pray that you would protect them this week. Father, that they would have opportunity to do the things that they were challenged to do today. Lord, we love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen. So next week we'll pick it up where we left off with the final chapter of Luke. Midweek is Wednesday, 7 o'clock, and we'll continue our study in Leviticus that we began last Wednesday. And Gape Feast is coming right up after service. And of course, my youngest son's birthday. So... Yeah, so that's, that's I can't believe he's, yeah, no, I can't believe he's four. That's just wild. It's flown by. God bless you guys. Have a great day.